Good morning to everyone. First, I want to uh, thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk in this opening session. So this year has been very exciting for the field of Alzheimer's disease. Um, as you know, uh, a drug, an antibody, was approved in the US, aducanumab, for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Despite the controversy, I think the landscape has changed significantly because we, we will start to think about novel therapies for the disease. One of the key factors for the approval was the development of biomarkers um, because they were key to diagnose early the patients and also to apply and to better design the clinical trials. Today, I will give you a brief summary of uh, the work we have been doing in Sao Paulo uh, in biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, many of the works are in collaboration with other groups in, in this country and, and from Fibernet. These are my, my disclosures for, for this talk. Okay. It's very sensitive. I can, uh, no, okay. So we, uh, over the last decade, we know more and more about the biology of Alzheimer's disease. So the, as, as Alzheimer described, the disease is characterized by two main lesions, amyloid plaques, and neurofibrillary tangles. This is considered the um, core pathology. Okay. And, but the, there are also other components of the disease, such as neuritic dystrophies, synapse loss, and uh, changes in astroglia and microglia. What is novel is that over the last two decades, we have tools, we have biomarkers to measure each of these processes in the brain uh, in vivo, so before the patient dies. And this has been key for the diagnosis and also to develop new therapies. Today I will talk about uh, some of the biomarkers we have been working on. Here you will see that in red, that are measures that can measure this process uh, in the brain. I'm sorry, but I, uh, this is... Just, okay. CSF, so cerebral spinal fluid, was described for the first time in the 18th century by Emanuel Swedenborg, and he um, described the CSF as a highly gifted Jewish. He was not a scientist, he was an engineer, but he was inspired in minds about the water that he could see inside the minds, and he thought that maybe something similar was happening inside the brain. So he went into into investigated this fluid, and he came up with uh, with cerebral spinal fluid. What I will try to convince you is that uh, he couldn't be more correct, because over the last ten uh, last two decades, we have developed very promising and very good biomarkers in CSF, and I will tell you later uh, also in blood. In addition to the change in biomarkers, uh, there has been a conceptual uh, change in the field of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, this was uh, nicely published in 2018 in this paper, and this framework is labeled as ATN. A stands for amyloid, T for tau pathology, and N for neurodegeneration. And uh, this is similar to other systems that uh, are applied in cancer. So in this way, you can classify uh, each of the biomarkers in each of these three key processes. Uh, a, uh, and if you are, uh, all the main biomarkers are negative, then you are normal. But if you have an amyloid positive marker and either tau biomarker or neurodegeneration marker, then you are in the spectrum of Alzheimer's disease. And I want you to keep this, uh, this scheme because I will go back to this later when I talk about blood. Uh, when we talk about biomarker, it's important uh, to, uh, to think of reliability of the assays. Um, and uh, this is a nice paper that classifies the, bi the biomarkers depending on whether you have reliable assays or not. And here, most of the markers I will discuss today uh, are uh, biomarkers for which we have reliable uh, assays. Uh, 
Markers, biomarkers of, of Alzheimer's disease were developed uh, more than two decades ago. The first one was um, uh, CSF biomarkers here on the left in 1995. The first description that amyloid beta was reduced in the CSF of patients with Alzheimer's disease. And some years later, uh, there were the first amyloid pay traces were developed in 2004. Since then, uh, this has been a, a very uh, fast grow in biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease. And um, we know today that uh, there are three, three markers that can be reliably measured in CSF in Alzheimer's disease. And uh, there is a pat very consistent pattern, uh, which consists of reduced A beta 42 and an increase in total tau and phosphorylated tau. This is called the signature of Alzheimer's disease. When we see this change with pattern in the CSF, we know that it's highly associated with changes in the brain of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, is it, you need to get CSF, you need to do a lumbar puncture. This is a well-known procedure in neurology. The only caveat is that you need to use a special needles to, to avoid uh, side effects, but this is a very safe and, and, and safe procedure uh, in neurology. In our group, we haven't worked uh, with another parameter, with another metric, which is the ratio 42 to 40. And I will show you data that this ratio is actually more specific uh, than a beta 42. To validate biomarkers in our group, we started in 2009 with a biomarker program that we call SPIN. SPIN stands for Sampao Initiative on Neurodegeneration. And this is a, a research program in which we invite healthy controls and also patients with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. Um, as part of the uh, clinical routine, they are invited to join also this program and to give uh, CSF and other uh, fluids. For, uh, for this biomarker validation of our, or, or, or biomarker research. Uh, we started in 2009 to give you a, an idea how, this, how, how slow this process can be. So we started in 2009 with the first CSF analysis. And in 2019, so 10 years later, uh, we were able to really transfer all this knowledge to the hospital, to the biochemistry department, and now they take care of all the analysis as part of the clinical routine. So it can take 10 years to really validate one biomarker from research to clinical practice. Uh, and I'll, another key date here I want to I wanna mention is in 2012, we, start, we started the DAPNI protocol, which is a specific program uh, of Alzheimer's disease for people with Down syndrome. This has been a very successful program, and I will show you some data uh, on biomarkers in this population. Uh, as part of this biomarker program, the number of lumbar punctures in the unit has been continually growing every year. Uh, up to in 2019, we reached 371 lumbar punctures uh, per year. Uh, of course, in 2020, there was a drop due to COVID, uh, but we are recovering the activity uh, back to the, pre to, to the 2019 levels. This is important because in terms of resources, you need to, uh, you, you need uh, physicians who, who do more lumbar punctures. Instead of seeing patients at the office as we used to do many years ago, you need also physicians who take care of the lumbar punctures. And this is important when you plan resources. Another key step for the development of biomarkers in CSF for Alzheimer's disease was technology. Uh, I will go back to these concepts uh, several times. In 2018, uh, there were uh, some fully automated platforms that were able to measure very reliable the analytes with much less variability than the conventional immunoassays. Uh, this was key to really implement these markers in clinical practice. Uh, there are two main platforms that are being used. They are widely available, so many of the hospitals have access to these platforms. So another, besides that the, we had the patients, we had the platforms, but another key thing in CSF has been the use of the, how, to, how to use cutoffs. There are many ways to, uh, to, to calculate cutoffs, but you need to know what's normal and what's abnormal. And this has been very challenging in Alzheimer's disease, especially for the amyloid beta peptide, because it's very sticky, it's very prone to aggregate, and it's difficult to work in the lab. Uh, in this study that was led by, by Dr. Daniel Alcolea, a neurologist in, the, in our group, uh, we used amyloid PET to validate the cutoffs, and we could cal calculate very well uh, 
uh, accurate cutoffs for a beta uh, 42 to 40 ratio for total tau and phosphorylated tau. And this has been a very important work because these, these are the cutoffs that we use in clinical practice. And our practice has changed because of this work. Um, we also are, have measured um, these core biomarkers uh, in the population with Down syndrome. Down syndrome, people with Down syndrome uh, have an ultra high risk of developing Alzheimer's disease due to the triplication of the APP gene. Uh, APP gene is the gene that generates amyloid and this overproduction of amyloid uh, leads to a very high uh, prevalence of Alzheimer's disease uh, in, at, at the age of, of from, from 40 and above. Here you can see the biomarkers in this population. In blue, you see the controls. Uh, in red, you see the people with Down syndrome, and you see how, uh, how different that this biomarker change in CSF very early. Already from the third decade of life, you can start seeing uh, changes in how this deviates from normality. And this reflects that this is a genetic form of Alzheimer's disease, and they, they have really a high risk of developing uh, Alzheimer's disease uh, through life. Um, as I said, we recommend to use the uh, a beta 42 to 40 ratio instead of a beta 40 uh, because we think it's more specific linked to Alzheimer's disease pathology. Here, this is an unpublished data. Uh, here, we look at, uh, I want to look at, show you the sample size here is more than uh, 1800 CSF samples that we have collected over the years. And what we see is that when we look at the ratio 42 to 40, this is, uh, it, it shows a stronger association with uh, neurodegeneration, with total tau and phosphorylated tau that we know this is characteristic of Alzheimer's disease. So we uh, strongly recommend uh, this ratio instead of a beta 42. Another example of uh, the, uh, the better performance of this ratio uh, comes from the field of frontotemporal dementia. This is another dementia less frequent than Alzheimer's disease and affects younger patients. And, and we could see that when we look at amyloid beta species in CSF in frontotemporal dementia, the levels tend to be a little bit low, as you can see here in red, compared to controls, not as low as Alzheimer's disease. But uh, when we use uh, the ratio 42 to 40, then uh, we see that you can correct for these levels and then you don't see differences contr with controls. Um, on the right, you see that also the levels of CSF, uh, the levels of A-beta in CSF correlate also with atrophy in the MRI because many of the subjects also have a research MRI. We can correlate both, both measures. And we see that the, the A-beta peptides in CSF correlates with the areas of more atrophy. This is intriguing. We think this is, uh, this is due to neuronal and synaptic loss, uh, and probably this APP amyloid uh, is expressing neurons, and if you lose neurons, you also uh, may lose also, you have also reductions in a beta peptides. And also, as I mentioned, aducanumab was approved this year in the US, um, and CSF was key for uh, this approval. This is the data released by Biogen, the company, showing that the CSF biomarker, in particular phosphotal and total tau, were reduced in patients treated with aducanumab. The CSF biomarkers are key in clinical trials, not only for diagnosis, but also for, correct, for the correct interpretation of the data of the trials. So again, uh, uh, CSF have, have been key instrumental in even in, approven, in, in the approval of, of the drugs and the clinical trials that still are ongoing. Um, these are the core biomarkers. These are the biomarkers that we use in clinical routine, but there are many others that are being investigated that can also provide complementary information to, uh, about processes that occur in the brain in Alzheimer's disease. One of the most popular assays of proteins biomarker is neurofilament light. Neurofilament light is a, is a protein expressed uh, in neurons, in axons, especially in, in large, uh, large caliber myelinated axons, so in certain type of axons. And, and therefore, uh, the levels increase uh, in CSF uh, when there is an axonal damage. Uh, 
In the unit, we also look at, at the levels of neurofilament light in CSF in, in, a, in a large group of patients, more than 500 subjects. And as you can see here, uh, the levels of neural min, neurofilaments increase in Alzheimer's disease, but it's not a specific of Alzheimer's disease. It is also present in many other conditions. As you can see here uh, in the center, there is a huge dramatic increase in ALS, in, in amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also in frontotemporal dementia, also in corticovasal syndrome. So it's not a specific for Alzheimer's disease, but it reflects non-specific axonal damage. We also look at neurofilaments in the people with Down syndrome. And as you can see here, there is also an increase, very early increase in neurofilaments in CSF. Uh, as you can see, the, 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 the image of phosphotau and neurofilaments are quite similar. So uh, that's because in this population, uh, the axonal damage come mainly from Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so it's, it's very kind of pure AD because they don't have other comorbidities. Uh, they usually, the, 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 the neurodegeneration markers uh, are also uh, very clear and also follow uh, AD biomarkers. Other, other markers that are being investigated in our group, we are very interested in synaptic proteins. Um, the synaptic proteins are uh, because synaptic loss is uh, one of the early features in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, there are many groups that are investigated synaptic proteins in CSF. Neurogranin is one of the most popular ones, SNAP25. In our group, we are focused on BAM2. BAM2 is a, is a vesicle-associated protein. Uh, this is a group led by Olivia Belvin, um, a Miguel Servet investigator in our group. Um, and, and we describe a set of nine proteins that were uh, particularly interesting in Alzheimer's disease. This, was a, this is a, a part of a patent that we have licensed to, to a company. And as you can see here, these proteins tend to increase in Alzheimer's disease. But intriguingly, they are low in the preclinical stage of Alzheimer's disease. So it's, they, they show it's, it's a decrease, and then later on during the disease, they uh, in, increase. And we think that these proteins may be additional, uh, they provide additional information to the neurodegeneration that occurs in Alzheimer's disease. We have also looked at BAM2 and CSF in Down syndrome. Uh, we see the same pattern that we see in a sporadic Alzheimer's disease. And interesting, we see that there is the, the marker that best correlates with cognitive decline in this population. So that fits with the idea that perhaps if synaptic loss, we know it's the best correlate um, of, of cognitive deficits in Alzheimer's disease, and that fits with that idea that perhaps synaptic proteins can be a good correlate uh, of cognition in Alzheimer's disease. So uh, to conclude this first part, uh, the message, the key message are that core biomarkers are already available in routine and are key for early diagnosis. The ratio 42 to 40 is preferred over Ibeta 42. Uh, tau and neurofilaments label overlapping but distinct process. We didn't go into data because we didn't have time, but they, they do not measure exactly the same thing. And there are other newer markers might be useful, but still the context of use has yet to be defined. And also, as I mentioned, the CSF are, have a key role in clinical trials. And I want to finish with blood because over the last five years, um, blood has become uh, a very interesting fluid. Uh, I would say that probably uh, the main advances over the last five years has been, have been in blood. Uh, CSF came first. And the experience that we have learned uh, in CSF have been instrumental to really learn and to develop very fast blood biomarkers. The main key, the key thing for the development of blood biomarkers have been the, uh, the, the advance or, or the, the new technologies that are available today. I will show briefly about uh, amyloid, tau, uh, neurofilament lights, and also I will finish very briefly with a GFAP, which is a marker of uh, glial activation because it's expressed mainly in astrocytes. So the history comes in 2007. Uh, there was already a paper published in a very good journal claiming that a combination of 13 proteins was enough to really classify Alzheimer's disease. This paper couldn't be replicated, but I think there was some signal that there was some kind of uh, signal was there, but, uh, but there was a lot of noise around. 
On the right, uh, there were studies on plasma uh, A beta in Alzheimer's disease. And as you can see here, the studies, the data were all over the place. But if you pull all the study, there was a trend that uh, the patients with Alzheimer's disease had a different ratio, 42 to 40, in plasma compared to controls. So there was something here, but we couldn't really measure them because of the lack of technology. The first technological advance occurred occur in uh, 2014. This was the first paper uh, using a new technology, uh, immunoprecipitation with mass spectrometry, which is very sensitive. Uh, that uh, it was a Japanese group published by Kaneko et al., who described for the first time that uh, patients with Alzheimer's disease could, be, could have a lower amyloid, especially the 42 to 40 ratio, uh, compared to controls. And they, could, uh, they replicated uh, this study in a much, much larger cohort uh, by Nakamura here in Nature on the right. This was a famous, famous paper because it shows that the precision, so at the area under the CUF is over 0.8, which means that there has a good diagnostic uh, value for Alzheimer's disease. However, mass spectrometry is very expensive. It's not accessible to many centers, and also you, you need to do uh, immunoprecipitation first. Um, so uh, it, was, it, was a, it was not easy to really uh, measure the samples. Despite this, in last year, um, these assays for beta amyloid were approved in the Europe, in the US, for the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And, and these are being used mainly in clinical trials so far. However, um, the, sorry. The main, uh, the, the, the second technological advance that occurred uh, that made possible to use plasma biomarker was the development of uh, the CIMOA platform. CIMOA is an ultra-sensitive platform developed by a company called Quanterix, an American company, uh, that has developed uh, some instruments that uh, provide immunoassays, immunoassays, but with a much higher sensitivity than conventional assays, more than 100 or 1,000 times more sensitive. This is based on a very, very cool technology. Um, and this has been made to, to measure analytes in blood that were not possible, uh, to, were not possible to measure before. The most popular assay of this company is neurofilament light. Uh, you can, using this technology, you can measure neurofilaments in blood. And neurofilaments, um, as I said, is a, is a protein derived from, from neurons, from axons and it's brain specific. So what you're using, in, you are, you're measuring in blood, it comes from the brain. So it's a very useful measure for uh, neuronal damage in many, many conditions. It's being used in multiple sclerosis, in, in, in traumatic brain injuries, so in many conditions where you need to look at neuronal damage. And it's a very popular assay for this company. I know there are, there are different instruments in Spain. I think as we have one, I think there is one here uh, uh, as well. Uh, and this uh, will become, I think, general practice. So each hospital will have to have one of these instruments at some point. Uh, we look at neurofilament levels in Down syndrome in plasma. Um, this is a, a work uh, led by Maria Carmona in our group. And as you can see here on the left, the uh, patients with Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease, they have higher levels of uh, neurofilaments in plasma. Uh, whether they are in the dementia state or they are in the prodromal uh, stage compared to those that are asymptomatic. But the most interesting thing uh, is on the right, that if you divide the levels of neurofilaments in plasma, uh, actually predict, have prognostic inf information. So uh, they predict the conversion of the, or the, or the presence of Alzheimer's disease in the future. And this is probably the most interesting use of neurofilaments. You can use them for uh, to look at neuronal damage um, in, in many conditions, but also for prognostic use. Uh, I'm sure this is being used already in multiple sclerosis to see if a drug works or not. You can, you can, you can monitor because blood is very e easy to, to, to is accessible. You can use it several times and to see if the drug uh, is working or not. And, uh, but, but the most promising uh, assay uh, in, in Alzheimer's disease has been uh, uh, the protein tau, uh, phosphorylated tau in plasma. Uh, 
the tau can be measured also in plasma, uh, and this was uh, uh, an advance that was uh, made possible mainly through uh, CMOA platforms. And last year, uh, the first paper that came out was this from Mayo Clinic in 2018, uh, where they saw that patients with Alzheimer's disease, here on the right, they had higher levels than controls. As you can see, there is still some overlaps. This was the first assay. But last year, there were uh, at least five different assays publications in very high impact journals showing that different forms of phosphorylated tau, 181, 217, 231, uh, were able to really detect uh, increases uh, in Alzheimer's disease compared to uh, controls. And interesting, this was not uh, present, this increase was not present in other tauopathies, for example, like frontotemporal dementia or uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So this was very specific, uh, this increase is very specific of Alzheimer's disease, as you can see here uh, on the right. So we look in our group, we have looked at phosphorylated tau uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, Kai Blenhoff and, and Henrik Setterberg in Sweden uh, in Down syndrome. And we can see also, we can replicate that uh, there is a, a nice increase in the levels of phosphorylated tau in Down syndrome, either in the dementia stage or in prodromal stages. You can see here um, uh, that also the area under the CUF is uh, over 0.8. So that means that this has a very good diagnostic accuracy for the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so that replicates that we see in the general populations in the people with sporadic Alzheimer's disease. And this was the first study to measure uh, phospho tau uh, in Down syndrome in plasma. And I want to go back to this idea of the ATN. ATN is a framework that uh, classifies patients according to the three important processes, so amyloid, tau, and neurodegeneration. So right now with blood, we have biomarkers in blood of the three different processes. So we can classify with a single blood test patients using uh, this scheme. So in our group, we uh, measure uh, these three biomarkers. Uh, we have uh, amyloid, we have uh, phosphorylated tau, and we have neurofilaments. And we look at this, this combination of three of them in the same cohort with the idea to see if they have, uh, what, what's the diagnostic value of these three markers. What we saw here is that phospho tau is the best marker by far, alone has a uh, precision of diagnostic accuracy of 0.8. But if you combine, it, if you combine uh, phospho tau with uh, A beta, with age and sex, then you can, you can reach an accuracy of 0.9. So that means that we have accurate ways to diagnose Alzheimer's disease using blood. Phospho tau is definitely the assay you want to include, but probably you can add other things to increase you, 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 the, 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 the diagnostic accuracy. The key question is, is this enough? Uh, I don't think that's enough to diagnose patients with Alzheimer's disease yet. This is a research study. This, all these assays are based on research only studies. Um, they are not approved for clinical practice, but I think they will soon be uh, part of the clinical routine, especially in the screening of, of patients, uh, uh, perhaps in the primary care settings or, or even uh, small hospitals, uh, which is much, because it's much more accessible than, than CSF. And these markers are already all being implemented in clinical trials. And just to finish, uh, I want to just one word about another marker, which I think is promising, which is GFAP, which is a marker expressed uh, in astrocytes. It can be measured uh, in blood using CIMOA as well. And this is the data that we have uh, generated. It's still paper uh, and published data. Uh, we see that uh, GFAP is also increased in Alzheimer's disease in plasma. And it's also increased in frontotemporal dementia, not as high as in Alzheimer's disease. And here on the right, uh, we, th there is the prognostic information. We see that the, 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 the tertile, the levels of GFAP also uh, can uh, predict the prognosis in frontotemporal dementia. So that is still, uh, I think, another marker, not part of the ATN, but I think it will be a useful marker, especially for Alzheimer's disease, still unclear why the levels are increased, but I think it's a, uh, at least a marker to, to follow. And just to conclude uh, this part, uh, I hope that I show you data that all ATN biomarkers are available in blood. 
uh, are already in use in clinical, uh, clinical trials. The ratio uh, A beta 42 to 40 in plasma is already approved in the US and Europe. Neurofilaments in plasma uh, is useful for prognostic evaluation and in clinical trials. And phosphotau in plasma uh, is very useful for the detection of Alzheimer's disease pathology and likely to be used soon in the screening in routine clinical practice. And just to finish, uh, I want to thank uh, the people in my group uh, and all the, the members who have contributed with uh, these data, especially those that are here underlined. Thank you for your attention.